In the name of Overhead Athletics Podcast, where we cover rehabilitation, biomechanics, human movement, and optimizing human performance. Alrighty. Welcome back to In the Name of Overhead Athletics Podcast. I'm Max Wardell, co-hosting today with Carter Kowalczyk. We are joined by Nick Sanziri. Nick is the owner of Sanziri Baseball. He was the youngest high school coach in the country, the youngest varsity head coach in the country for high school at 21 years old. He's also currently the pitching coach at Mission College in California, and he's previously been the pitching coach and a baseball coach at numerous other college and high school teams, as well as summer ball teams um, out in California and the surrounding area. Welcome to the podcast, Nick. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. We're looking forward to this one. Yeah. So, um, you know, before we get into too much, you know, if, uh, if you just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a brief background on um, your experience and how you actually got into that role as a varsity head coach um, at the high school level at such a young age and, and what that's um, led to in terms of the opportunities you've had to work with athletes. Yeah. Um, when I was uh, 19, 20 years old, I uh, was still playing. I was up at uh, University of San Francisco um, trying my best to make the team up there. Uh, it didn't go as planned for me. You know, uh, I was a hard thrower, you know, back in the day, 88, 90 miles an hour out of high school. So I had a little bit of a fastball, but got there, man, and just felt like I couldn't pitch. Felt like I, I was just kind of lost. And uh uh, my sophomore year of college, um, I was home in San Mateo for the weekend. Uh, I was walking down the street, picked up a newspaper, and it said uh, that the local high school coach had quit midseason. Um, it just kind of intrigued me, the story and everything. So I later that day, I just picked up the phone, um, gave the athletic director a call. Uh, from there, he said, hey, come on an interview for the job. So uh, I went in, I interviewed uh, kind of naively against uh, – you know, a lot of older coaches who were probably looking at me like, who is this kid? Um, but, you know, g got in there and, and, and tried my best to impress them, you know, uh, laid it all out there. And uh, they called me the next day, said I got the job. I was ecstatic, to say the least, just because I've, I've always wanted to coach. It was just kind of a, a matter of when I would start and, uh, you know, got the job at 21 and, and was there for my first couple years and uh, absolutely loved it. You know, I think, uh, uh, the, the team aspect of stuff is, is so much fun, especially, uh, you know, when you're that young and you're starting up. And uh, I had no clue what I was doing my first year. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of mistakes made. And, uh, but, yeah, I think you learn as you go, and I think there's no substitute for experience, you know. So, for me, it was, it was just a cool opportunity. It kind of fell in my lap type of thing. And uh, from there, uh, it's been eight years now, and I've kind of just been coaching all over the place. But uh, kind of an uh, interesting story there. I like that quote you said, uh, there's no substitute for experience. That's, uh, yeah. Maybe we could expand a little bit off of that. Just, I know some coaches um, that I've experienced in the past, they think you, know, you can throw a few bullpens every week and then maybe your number doesn't get called for three, four weeks and then you know, you're expected to perform. That's just your job. You know, what's your opinion on there's no substitute for experience? You know, that the bullpen life and grinding – compared to actually getting on the mound in the game? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a really good uh, topic to bring up. I think, you know, during quarantine, and especially uh, prior to quarantine, with all the, the stuff you see on social media, I think not that a lot of guys have become, you know, bullpen heroes, but you're seeing more of them nowadays, I think, than ever, where it's all about uh, the radar gun reading in the in, on the one pitch, or it's right. uh, the exit velo off the tee or something like that. And, and not that, you know, I'm trying to take away anything from kids because when you PR, obviously you're excited. You want to let people know, you know, it's a, it's a fun process, that whole thing. But I think it's uh, got to be balanced out with success in the game and, and kind of seeing how those tools play, because as we know that the game is so different than the controlled setting and training. I mean, you know, you can almost get anyone to PR or to, to, uh, to pop a number just by adding intent, you know, juicing them up, you know, giving them a trap slap and all of a sudden they, they pop a PR and it's like they hit 88. And it's, well, they really throw 83, but they, they, you know, threw their arm out to hit one. And, and uh, 
So I think it's it's always like, okay, the, the training stuff's great, but how how is this going to help me in a game? How, you know, what translates? And I think that's such a big uh, thing to understand, especially if you're a, a young player coming up in the game today, because I, I just can't imagine how much you're being bombarded with in terms of, uh, you know, videos, social media stuff, all, you know, all these kids, you know, throwing hard. So it's it's always, okay, how can I get out? So that's number one, um, you know, and, and, and how does it translate? Because if I'm just – blindly letting it loose, you know, once or twice a week with some weighted balls and maybe have a, a high intent day, you know, mixed in off the mound. It's generally it doesn't translate. Um, but I always say, what's the best test is, you know, throw a hitter in the box. Um, you know, go, go test it live. You know, if you're feeling good and, and the hitters will give you uh, the greatest feedback you'll ever have, you know? So I think it's, you know, what does and doesn't work in training is, is uh, all relative to just, Hey, can I get hitters out? You know, am I able to get, get missed barrels miss uh you know hard contact and get guys out so i think that's a that's a really good uh, point to bring up there and last yeah, episode I, we actually talked with uh ben brewster from tread athletics and one of the things that he mentioned is a lot of the guys with the uh, um they get carried away with this you know i need to train to get to a certain level and they never actually uh, get into competition enough and they're never facing live hitters and now they're two years removed or something like that from actually facing um, live batters um, or in a live game, and they kind of they lose. That's a skill as well that they that they lose as a result of trying to focus so much on these these gains, either long term or short term development, which is kind of what we're talking about here. And you're, you know, what we're seeing with this online, uh, I guess. Uh, the online presence so large in people's minds is they they're always after the short term game gain and what they're going to throw in their next bullpen rather than what right. they're going to be able to do two months from now, um, you know, in their high school season or in their college season. Yeah, no, the, the uh, you know, for me, when I recruit a kid or I, I'm looking at, you know, a pitcher to, to take to mission college or, or I, I'm looking at a high school kid, it's, it's always, uh, are they winners? Can they win baseball games? Because, you know, that there's so much emphasis, like you said, on, uh, on training that you sometimes get lost in it. You sometimes, uh, you know, get into training mode and, and now it's one, two years have passed and, and you haven't had any live competition, like you said. So I think ultimately, like if I'm looking at a pitcher, I want to recruit somebody, it's always, okay, I, I'm old school. Like what's their win loss record? Like, can they win baseball games? Because, you know, I know there's all these advanced metrics now and, uh, yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of great work on that. You know, I love learning about him and reading about him from really smart people. But for me, it's always okay. Can the guy win a game? Can he go out there and effectively keep his team in the game? Can he hold runners? Can he field his position? Can he get ahead of guys with an off speed pitch? You know, can he throw the fastball to both sides of the plate? You know, how is he mentally? Because in training, I mean, there's not a lot of factors in terms of mentally that that come into play other than uh, maybe uh, you know a little trash talk from one of your. Uh, one of your workout buddies, right? So there, there's so many more factors, man. When you got, you know, a jersey on, you got your costume on, you got, uh, you know, another team you're playing, you got, you know, girlfriend in the stands, right? It, you're, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new ball game when you get out there and, uh, you know, you're under the lights. So I think it's, it's always, okay, hey, can, can the kid win a baseball game? Can you, you know, ultimately, that'd be my message to the young kids is still always, hey, the, the guy who will move on is the guy that can get out and he can keep his team in the game, you know, regardless of how it looks, or if, uh, you know, the Instagram and Twitter, you know, movement police, you know, if they, uh, if they don't like it, it doesn't mean you can't win games, you know? So I think it's, it's, uh, it's all about, can you get outs? And, and that's kind of the, you know, the bottom line. Making sure it translates. Right. Exactly. If it, if it doesn't translate, right. Who, you know, who cares? Right. It's, it's, right. It doesn't matter. You know, no, no, no one cares about a five o'clock hitter. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, and, there, and there, I feel like there's more, and this is, I don't want to hit on hitters either, but I feel like there's more than ever now just because of, you know, you, you go to BPs, man, and everybody now in college, even the little guys are trying to just get that, that launch angle, you know? And yeah. uh, I'm like, man, what, you know, to me as a pitching coach, I'm like, man, I love calling games against those guys because they, they give away a lot, you know, they, they give away a lot for the slim chance they'll run into one. So it's, what scares me always is the, you know, the, uh, the Jose Altuve approach, you know, the, the, the guys who are three thirty who can hit to all fields, you know, those, those guys are uh, a lot scarier than the, uh, the launch angle guys. Absolutely. And uh, baseball is definitely a game of highs and lows. I know you guys focus on a, a lot of the mental game at San Ziri baseball. You guys have a motto, um, stay level. Could you yeah. maybe 
discuss what that means to you guys and your athletes? Yeah, I think uh, it, it, during the evaluation process and kind of the onboarding process, we spend a lot of time, uh, myself and, and my strength trainer, um, getting to know the kids in terms of their mentality and making sure that, you know, letting them know that we're not really going to deal with negative emotion. Um, you know, we view it as kind of a waste of time and that, you know, the days you come in, you might PR, it might be a great day and you're, you're feeling great, you know, or something. And then, you know, on, on the down days, uh, you know, you still have to, to find a way to stay positive. And I think staying level, not getting too high or too low over the course of a baseball game is as cliche as that sounds has been monumental for my players. Um, guys really, really buy into it. And it's, it's a simple motto that, uh, I have wristbands the kids wear and they'll often, you know, stuff's going bad. They'll look down at it and, and uh, brings them a little bit of peace. We actually have uh, four or five guys of uh, my guys who got it tattooed on them. They believe it. Oh, believe wow. it. Hey. Cool. It, wasn't, it wasn't like a cult <laughs> That's buy-in like, yeah. right there. That's yeah, buy-in. You know, I wasn't going to be like, I don't post about it because I don't want people to say, oh, man, you know, this is like a cult or something. I'm like, no, they just really believe in it. You know, they, they really trust yeah. the process and they, uh, they love it and, and, you know, especially the junior college level, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the kids I get maybe maybe didn't have uh, ideal circumstances in high school or maybe didn't have the greatest opportunity. So for them, they really grab it and, uh, and get after it. And, and the same motto goes for the guys I, that I work with you know, at the major league level. It's all about staying level, not getting too high or too low and, and understanding that this game is so tumultuous and so uh, so tough day to day that if you're if you have kind of that grind mentality where every day is a grind. It's you're gonna get worn out, man, if you're trying to do this thing for for the long run. So I think it's all about uh, how can you find the positive even when things are going negative. So I always challenge my guys. You know, if they have a a bad outing or or something goes wrong, I always challenge them the next day. We'll talk about it. I'll say, okay, well, what's the positive from this? And sometimes it takes a second. Sometimes it takes them a second to uh, you know to to think about it. Maybe a whole practice, and they come back and they go, Coach, well, hey, you know, I. I you know, wasn't throwing my cutter well yesterday, you know, outside the Tarides, but man, I, I did a good job with the arm side fastball. Okay, cool. We, we found a positive and that's something we can build on, you know, and I think uh, this game is so tough and so humbling that uh, if, if you stay level and are in control of your emotions, I tell my guys, you generally are going to have a pretty good outcome, you know, versus letting your emotion, let, let the game take your emotions over. So I think uh, Staying level is has been it's kind of grown. It originally when I was twenty one was just kind of a uh, saying, but now it's uh, it's become almost like a lifestyle for my guys, and, I, and I'm so proud of the way they've uh, they've taken it and and, and their day to day. They've really taken it to the next level. I kind of just started it, and they're uh, they're really doing a great job. So the credit goes to them there. It's it's a pretty simple motto, um, but probably you know more difficult to embody. Mm -hmm. What type of steps do you guys take maybe preseason or pregame mentally, you know, mental routines and stuff like that to develop, you know, to work on the state level mindset? Yeah, no, we, we do a ton of affirmations. Um, we do a ton of visualization. Um, every day of practice, they have uh, a visualization tasks to achieve, whether it be uh, simulate a successful inning um, at the base level, or it could be, hey, you came in second and third year reliever, you came in second, and third against this team. Uh, awesome. get out of it, find a way to get out of it. I'm just not giving you calls. We, you know, we'll have a, uh, an umpire hates you visualization where basically you're trying to picture that you're not getting anything. You know, your ump is just not giving you any calls and you got to get in there and find a way to, uh, to battle out of it. So I'll give them different scenarios. They do it five, six times a week. Um, and then some guys more, you know, some kids will, uh, they'll do the, the team visualization, then they'll go, uh, in the other bullpen and I'll see them, you know, an hour after practice going through some more affirmations. Um, I think it's so powerful uh, just to uh, see it into existence, I think is so big. So I, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, hippie-ish, I guess, there in the sense that, you know, it, it really does work for guys. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, too uh, versed on the, the science behind it, but I, I just see the results in terms of guys who spend time getting their mind right and, and visualizing. Uh, they, they tend to do well. And, and one thing we'll even do is, I'll, and they kind of look at me funny when I do this, but I'll say, hey, go visualize a bad end. Go visualize that you just you just gave up a nuke. You gave up a grand slam. And now you're in the dugout and I'm yelling at you, you know, and coach is yelling at you, you know, coach skips getting mad at you. And uh, now it's okay, what are you gonna do next? What are you gonna do next? What's the next thing you do? Are you gonna be a guy who, you know, is gonna pout in the corner and, and go grab a, a teammate to talk about how much you hate coach and how much you hate uh, you know what just happened, or are you gonna be a guy that's gonna, you know, kind of have a dog mentality and step up and, and fix the problem? So it's 
uh, you know, we, we don't just visualize the positive, we'll do both. And I think that's uh, something that's been really powerful for my guys day to day. Yeah, and that's, that's really yeah. interesting. Um, you know, because a lot of people, they uh, visualize the perfect scenario every single time. And then, right. you know, they're visualizing what's in their control, which is probably helping their abilities. But a lot of times we're thrown, especially in baseball, there's so many things out of your control. That right. There's a uh, fluctuation in the environment. And now I'm not really sure how to adapt to that because I've never been in this scenario. And I've only visualized uh, scenarios where everything has gone absolutely perfectly. Um, right. But kind of what you're saying here is a, is a really interesting and um, novel uh, thought, which is imagine and visualize how you're going to react to, and you're going to react positively to even when there's negative circumstances, which, which is really interesting. And for all the people out there and all the listeners who are saying visualization uh, affirmations, what is this garbage? They've actually shown now that um, when you visualize and you're in a deep visualization state that your neurological recruitment patterns are in a similar pattern to that of actually performing the skill, except at a lower intensity. So there's actually a uh, neural drive or an efferent output to the muscles that would contract in the similar sequence to the way they contract when you're actually performing the skill. And we know wow. that, um, you know, imagery and uh, visualization actually can be any, there's different uh, studies say different things, but anywhere from 30 to 20% as effective as actual practice. So for the guys that are injured and maybe can't get out there and throw a hundred throws, uh, this is the way to go. And, and I think what Nick's saying here is a, a interesting and really cool approach, which is visualize how you're going to react to situations as well, not just how you're going to physically perform. Right. Right. No, that, that's it. Yeah. The, cause you know, it's easy, right. When we're, uh, when we're doing well and we're, we're shoving, you know, it's, it's easy. Everyone wants that. That's easy to see, but, but what's harder, like you said, is, you know, Hey, stuff doesn't go your way. Shortstop makes an error behind you in a big situation. Now you got runners on second and third and you got to pitch out of it. You got to find a way. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the ability to realize that, Hey, I can get myself, I can dig myself out of a hole. I think that's uh, kind of the mark of a, a true ace, right. Is, you know, the guy that uh, not only can, can, you know, when everything's going his way, be the guy, but man, when steps, you know, a little negative and everybody's down on themselves, are you going to be a guy that, that picks everybody up and says, no, I got this. No, we're okay. Or are you going to be a guy that, uh, you know, sulks and kind of is a woe is me guy. And, and I, when I see ball players, I kind of see one or the other. So I try to get my guys to, uh, you know, to be the ladder there and, and say, Hey, you know, when stuff's going bad, I want the ball. I want, I'm going to get us out of this. We're going to be okay. And, uh, and the guys have done such a great job of that. It's it's uh, such a joy being out there with them. I miss it just because of that that kind of competition, man. Cause I love when things go bad. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I love it. You know, it's, it's, uh, and, like my players, like you crazy. I'm like, no, I love it, man. Cause it shows me who you are. You know, it shows me what yeah. kind of kid you are, what kind of man you're going to be, what kind of dad you're going to be. You know, and and uh, so for me, I, I see him down the road, and I'm like, man, this is this is so cool. You know, so I think that's a really big point. It's really cool what you were saying too about kind of the neurological effects of of the visualization. That's super interesting. I, I got to look more into that. Yeah. In yep. my, it's almost like, you know, we were talking about how there's no substitute for experience. In my opinion, it's the visualization is like a part of that experience. You know, it's a piece of the puzzle right. that, you know, maybe some people might never get to game seven, you know, two outs, bases loaded, whatever, but if they can visualize that scenario and what they're going to be feeling or doing or the fans or whatnot, they're going to be more prepared. They're going to have more pieces of that puzzle of that experience compared to someone who I think did not, so. Right, right. That's a great point, definitely. What about um, in-game mental tips? So I know you guys mentioned the wristbands. You know, it, it's like a beacon yeah. of something you can relate back to, level your head, stay level. Um, what other type of in-game, you know, mental, uh, you know, uh, yeah. skills or stuff do you bring, you know, to your players? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's another good question. I think uh, – the biggest thing is, is controlling what you can control, you know, as, as simple as that sounds, because the, the only time we tend to get out of our mentality, especially as ballplayers, when we worry about stuff we can't control, you know, a, a, a bad call, an error behind us, maybe a, a pitch slipped out of our hand. And now, you know, we're thinking about that last curve ball we threw instead of the next pitch we have to make. So it's, it's really about number one, controlling what you control and then getting back to level, you know, and understanding that I, I tell my players that 
you know, there's kind of a one to 10 scale. One, one being you're so relaxed, you're like asleep out there. You know, 10 being like you're gripping the lightning, like you're like Brian Wilson or something. You know, you're just like <laughs> geeked up, right? And so I tell my guys, try and stay at about a six where you're, you're geeked up, you're aggressive, but you're not, you know, gripping it too hard. And you're not too far, uh, you know, asleep or, or relaxed. So it's, it's that fine line of, okay, hey, when success happens, and I go out and I strike out the side and, and uh, you know, I'm dapping everybody up in the dugout. I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm the big guy, right? And, and that's when you could get, go from a six to a, a seven, eight, or a nine. If you take that seven, eight, or nine out to the field, now you could be in trouble because now your, your arousal levels through the roof, you're too excited. You start overthrowing and now all of a sudden you got second and third, you know, bases loaded. And it's like, what happened last inning you were sharp. And so it can happen when you're successful too. that, that kind of, uh, you know, the, the negative effects. And, and obviously the same could be said for going the other way where stuff doesn't go your way. Now you go from a six, now you're a three and you're just like, man, I, you know, you're defeated. So it, it's all about, you know, self check and self-reflection, step off the mound, look to center field, uh, look down at the wristband and try and get back to that six before you make a pitch. Because if you're at that six, you know that most of the time you're going to be successful. You're not going to let your emotions play into the pitch. You're just going to make a pitch. And, and I, I think uh, we, the check-in process we have, um, I'll often challenge kids, like especially if, uh, you know, a, a kid will come in and, and uh, dominate an angle, like he'll strike out the side and everybody's going crazy for him. And I'll, you know, I'll dap him up. And then right after that, the, the, the thing that they'll hear me say over and over is get back to a six. You know, start to dial it down. Like, that's great what you just did out there, and everybody's all pumped for you and everything. But get back to a six, you can go compete again. You know, you, you can get a little more pumped. And, and same thing when it goes bad. It's okay, hey, stuff didn't go your way. You know, it, uh, while you're in the dugout, you're sitting next to your catcher or whatever, get back to that six. Um, and for some guys, that means, hey, they do a little visualization to get themselves back. Some guys uh, like to be super talkative and kind of, you know, shoot the, shoot the shit with their buddies in the dugout, and all of a sudden they're back to where they need to be. But I think everybody's uh, emotional tank, I call it, is a little bit different. Um, so it's just finding out, okay, how much do I need to pour in or take out or pour out of this guy to get him back to where he needs to be, you know, to be successful. And everyone's different there. You know, some guys six will be a little more, uh, you know, high energy than others. Uh, you know, other guys six will be like, man, he's not even awake. But, it, but it, it's finding, okay, what makes this player tick and, and how can we get him back there? But I would say like in game, visualization is huge for us. Uh, we still do the affirmations in game and then we challenge all the players to get back to a six as quickly as they can. You know, the, the kind of act like you've been there before uh, mentality where it's great, great to celebrate. We're all about that, but then we got to dial it back in right away because the next pitch is coming or the next game, you know, you have a great game and you want to, well, we got a game the next day, you know? Right. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a tough league we're in. So it's about uh, how, how can I get back to kind of neutral and, and level in order to, to make the best decisions, you know, on the field. Absolutely. If we want to kind of uh, switch gears here just uh, a little bit, you know, how, how does, um, you know, what you do in terms of your variable training methods and how you use all these different types of throwing drills on different surfaces, um, maybe on a hill, um, maybe you're on a foam, like AirX style pad, and how, how yeah. do you use those things to kind of develop feel in your athletes? And actually, what kind of results have you seen in terms of performance as a result of using these variable uh, training methods for throwing? Yeah, that, that's a, another great question. I think uh, the, the biggest thing I've learned doing this for eight years is that everyone's so different in a sense that you really don't ever have it dialed in in terms of, okay, hey, th these are the set of drills that's going to get you here. It's more of a constant process of experimenting. And I think over the last eight years here, I, I've just gotten better at that process, kind of funneling in my experiments. So when I see a player, I can go, okay, here's a general, you know, outlook of stuff that's going to help this guy. Is it all going to help him? Probably not. I mean, very rarely does everything help him, but we have to start experimenting and figuring out, okay, hey, what works for this guy and what doesn't. And I think that's such an individual process and what makes this such an art. I mean, as you guys know, it's, you may get a kid and, and uh, you see him and you go, okay, uh, you know, we're going to do a, a rocker variation. And it's going to click like, this is it. I know it. And then he does it. And you're like, wow, that, that sucked. Like that was, that was not good. Like it was, it was just, it wasn't performed well. He was arm signing everything. He felt crappy, you know, and you're like, well, but on paper it should work. So it's always, okay, here's kind of a general outline for the kids. So will come in, do an evaluation, get to know each other a little bit. Um, 
give them a, a basic outline of, okay, hey, maybe it's some air X pad drills. Maybe it's, uh, you know, some throwing the football around. Maybe it's uh, some band assisted work on your hinge or whatever it may be. But we start that process of experimenting. I, I, I uh, don't call it 10,000 hours. It's just more of 10,000 experiments. You know, I always tell my guys that it's, it's more about just, okay, hey, being in the lab and, and having someone that can generally guide you. And, and do I have all the answers? By no means. But I try and put up the guardrails for them so that they can be on the right path to figuring it out. Because is it going to be overnight or in a month? As you guys know, of course not. You're not going to not going to figure it out that quickly as much as, uh, you know, Twitter and Instagram would, would make you believe if you're a young kid nowadays that it's just, you know, one month and you're at 90. But it's more about uh, – for each individual, what experiments can we do and how often can we experiment? You know, and then we take that data, we, we look at it, the video, uh, the metrics, and we go, okay, did this work or was it, was it crappy? And I think that process is really how you define what works for each player. I don't think there's any, my advice to like a young coach out there would be don't pigeonhole yourself and, and say, these are my five fundamental drills I do because I, when I was 21, I did that. I had three or four, like, these are the absolutes. You got to do these drills. Everybody has to do them. And then now it's like, that's completely blown out of the water. There's no such thing as a, you know, a, a drill that works for everybody. So it's all about like it, back to that kind of stay level team concept stuff. It's what can you do to get that kid to stay at a six in training, you know, mentally and to get the most out of it for him. And sometimes it means saying the wrong thing to get the right result, which is crazy too, where, you know, the, the kid goes, uh, you know, man, I'm just really feeling like I'm pushing off the mound today, coach. I'm really, really pushing, pushing. And I'm like, well, pushing off the mound isn't generally something that that kid should do maybe but it's working for him so what i'm gonna what i'm gonna say for the next three four weeks is hey man you're doing a great job pushing off the mound i'm gonna try and speak his language you know get on the same page with him the way he sees his body moving because ultimately i tell my players i have one view for you you know i i view you and i go okay this is what it should look like in my eyes but ultimately it's what works for you and how are you reacting to what i'm saying am i speaking your language what ultimately do you see for yourself and then that picture they're building I just try and help out with as many experiments as I can so it's it's really them leading you know the 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 cart I'm just uh you know being dragged along I guess and and making sure that uh, the guardrails are up for them they don't they don't veer off path too much that's basically my main job I'm not uh you know a guy who I and I see a lot of great stuff out there from uh, like like you were talking about Ben Brewster or, or driveline baseball they, they do tremendous work and there's so much good stuff and my message to all the kids watching that stuff and everything is generally the stuff that, that myself post Ben driveline, any of those guys is stuff that just worked for one kid at that time, you know? So by no means are they a fix for everyone. You know, I, I posted some earlier today about throwing a football off the mound, you know, and it, it's a, it's a fun drill that, that I feel like for me personally, and a couple of my guys really gets their arm on time. I had a, uh, an MLB guy who was struggling with his, with arm drag, um, he's just started throwing the football off the mound and just kind of playing around with it one day. And all of a sudden it just clicked. And, you know, is that, you know, is the throwing the football the same as throwing a baseball? Of course not. It's probably not something you'd want to, uh, you know, do it full intent, but as a field drill for that player at that time, it really worked for him. So now we, we call it, uh, you know, it's, it's his drill and, and he kind of took ownership over it. And I love that because now the player can dive deeper into it rather than me. You know, they're, their buy-in has to be higher than mine in this stuff. If I'm, if I'm the guy who's calling you and texting you and telling you you got to do this stuff, it's usually the other way around where I'll get a text at two in the morning, coach, look at this dry rep I just did. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, it's two o'clock, but I love it. It fires me up. Like you're, you're, you're figuring it out, right? It's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm just your coach. I'm helping right. guys, but ultimately it's, you got to be the guy to do it, you know? And that's, that's really the, uh, kind of the empowering thing I have for my guys. But, but yeah, the process is such a, a process of experimentation, I think. And I, I like what you said there about, you know, speaking the athlete's language. And you may have an athlete, and I see this all the time, where the athlete's got the ball way too far away from their head and they're dragging their arm through and they're exposing maybe their UCL. Because I see a lot of injured guys as this Carter. And, um, you know, we see these guys and they have these – pathological mechanics where they put their arm in a uh, precarious position where they could get injured and then you change something in their arm or you have them do a drill that puts them in the opposite position to get them away from the uh, position of injury and they say well now it feels like uh, it feels like I'm uh, short arming the ball or it feels like I'm not lifting the ball the right way it's well you were long arming the ball before so we got to get you to do something the right way so 
you know, speaking the athlete's language and kind of getting them to say, okay, all right, you don't, you, you perceive this as poor or bad. You don't like uh, the feeling of this, or you don't like how it feels like you're short arm yet. Now we got to, I have to speak their language a little bit, even though they probably should short arm it more than they were before. I have to speak their language a little right. bit and get them to see it in a different light and kind of say, okay, but see, you're not short arm it here. You're, you're actually getting farther towards the target at this phase of the throw and stuff like that. So I think yeah. that's really, really important what you said. And, and at times, you know, they may follow a cue that could be horrible for 25, uh, other guys and they're the one or 24 other guys and they're the one guy out of 25 that that needs that cueing or that specific um intention of the drill and so for them you know continuing to uh think in that way is going to be very very beneficial but if i if i gave that to five other kids or even one other kid it might be horrible so right I think, uh, another good point to emphasize is not only like the communication is important you almost you know, you pretty much change the language too when you incorporate a football in it in my head i think you know you can get too close to the sport you can get you know you know everything about the baseball throw and the hitting throw but you just can't find the problem it's like if you put them in a different light put another sport in there compare it to a different sport even like you know i've been taking up working on golf a lot and i was talking to a guy who's really good at golf and he's like well what'd you do in your baseball swing I'm like, you know what? You're right. Like that's, you know, it's like it's similar <laughs> positioning. And so when you can incorporate other sports into the movements, you know, at the end of the day, they're movements. I think it really helps to get through to some athletes too. Definitely, definitely. Um, what do you think? Last point, Max. Yeah. Yep. So you made a tweet the other day, um, based off or based on deception. You said, you know, it's not. It can't be quantified objectively, but it's still just as important as those quantifiable right. numbers. Maybe in, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what deception is for you in the throw and, and then maybe we can touch on some of our points too. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think the, the first, uh, the person I'll always, you know, talk to or interview per se about perce or the, you know, deception is the hitters, you know, and, and getting their feedback. So <clears throat> whether we do a, uh, a sim game, a scrimmage, something like that. I'll always talk to hitters right after as quick, sometimes right after they're at bat, um, to get as much feedback as possible while it's still fresh on their mind. And hitters will tell you such interesting things. It's incredible yeah. because, you know, one example from earlier this year, we had a, a pitcher who was a pitcher of the year type of player, um, unbelievable talent, you know, 89, 92, could spot four pitches anywhere he wanted. And, and we're working on a cutter, you know, or a slider, I'm sorry, slider. And uh, he'd kill me if I said cutter, slider. And, uh, we're thrown into the bullpen and everything, and, and it's getting good. Rapsodo metrics are crazy. We finally got some negative vertical break on it, like two inches. It was positive before, so it was it was hanging up a little bit. <clears throat> and then we get the game with it, and he has just given up barrels in the scrimmage, like I've never seen before. Like he gave up two or three barrels in a row, and I'm like, how are they hitting this? Because metrics wise, it looked good. The catcher who was catching the pen, man, this thing is nasty. You know, the the player himself felt like he was the best he ever felt, but ultimately we talked to the hitter and he goes, yeah, man, you know, number one, you're adjusting it in your glove so I can see you're throwing it. And number two, your arm slot, it's a little bit higher when you go to that slider. So I can see out of your hand. So, so you're like, well, damn, you know, and, and the rap Soto, you know, it release height was only an inch higher, but perception wise, the guy noticed it. And so it just eliminated everything we did. And it, it's kind of that humbling moment, like, damn, you know, this is, it's great that stuff works in the lab and I have nothing against guys who are designing pitches and stuff. But to me, it's like, you can't really, know a pitch is going to work or design an arsenal per se, unless you throw a hitter in there. So for me, the, the first part of deception is always, what are the hitters seeing? Are they seeing it early? Are they seeing it big? Are they on time with your rhythm? Cause that's a big thing too. But uh, I think that's the first person I talk to. And then once we get that info of, okay, Hey, I was seeing it. Now we go to work and we try and fix it. Um, anything from adjusting the glove position to maybe even just hiding the ball a little bit longer with your front shoulder. And, and ultimately that, leads him to staying closed and now the slider sharper and later. But I think deception is the, the, the first person I always talk to is the hitter because they'll, they'll light you up. They don't, you know, they don't care how good it is. You'll feel great about stuff and you get in there and you're just like, why did that ball rattle off the wall? You know, and the guy's like, well, I saw it the whole way, you know, it hung up there. I could, I could read the spin. So I think uh, for me, it's first talk to the hitters and then secondly, try and take that info from the hitters and use it against them. So, you know, they'll, they'll give it away. They'll say, this is what it is. And it's like, okay, well, now we know. So now let's try and use that against you in competition and see if we can get you out. Because the, 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 the deception thing, the reason I put that, I was thinking about it. 
Um, there, there's so many guys who uh, don't factor in it at all. You know, it's crazy, right? It's like we do all this training, all, you know, all this velocity work, and it's like you're throwing whatever, 92 when you're 16, and that's tremendous accomplishment in and of itself. But, I mean, if they can see it and it's straight, well, now your you're 92 is playing like it's 85, 86. So I think they're, you know, the – uh, the hitters, you know, what, what do I find just some general things that they don't like are, you know, um, elbows and knees, you know, coming at you from different angles, um, varying arm slots to a degree they're uncomfortable with, um, hiding the ball is always the best one. And for me, that's uh, a shorter arm action. Does everybody have a short arm action? Of course not. But the, the guys who can do it, generally a short, quick arm gets on hitters pretty quickly is the feedback I see. They don't like it. It's uncomfortable for them. And, and if I can make the hitter uncomfortable, well, man, I, I won that at bat before it started. If they, they're like, man, this is, I'm just not going to be able to, to weight transfer here or something. So I think it's always for deception for me, how I try to quantify it is take my notes on what the hitter said, go home that night, devise a plan, and then we attack it the next day. I'm, okay, let's see if we can actually – build a little bit of deception and that can mean anything it can mean a quicker pace it can mean you know pulling a hezzy a hesitation at the top of your delivery it could be hey uh you know slide stepping a change up when this guy comes up because he's just sitting you know high knee change up and you slide step one on and now he now he's all screwed up so it's it, uh i think that's kind of the process for that of how i try to quantify but i i just the reason i tweeted that i just feel like there's not a big enough emphasis on deception which is ultimately like that's what gets a hitter out is how can you move the baseball to different locations, different arm slots, make him think one pitch is coming. I think if you're not deceptive, you know, who cares how good your stuff is? Cause at some level, it may not be uh, high school or college. It may be pro ball, but at some level they're going to get on you if you don't have deception. And, and you just don't want that to be the, uh, you know, the reason your career ends is man, I, I threw 99, but I, you know, they were seeing it well, that, that sucks, you know? So it's all about to talk to the hitters and then use that info, uh, against them to the best of, of your ability. Some yeah, people might awesome. be, some listeners might be thinking, you know, well, other than shortening my arm, you know, how can I work on deception? I would even categorize, you know, establishing one side of the plate versus the other to open up the other side in that right. category as deception. Because it's like you said, if your 92 mile an hour fastball is all you got, you know, it really becomes like an 85 mile an hour fastball. People can sit on it, whatever, reaction yeah. times increase and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got a, oh, yeah. I, I got a question point. for you. Oh. Um, Nick, if there was one thing you could change about um, either the baseball world or the baseball training world, um, you know, what would that be? Um, it, to me, if there was one thing I could change, I guess it, it would be just more positivity towards kids trying to get better. I think – I see a lot of uh, of guys who are bigger name guys with just kind of negative outlooks on things. And I think there, there's so many critics in this game already in terms of uh, what to do, what not to do in terms of training, you know, throw this pitch, don't throw this pitch. This is right. This isn't that I think, you know, if I'm a player, I, I just want that positivity because I'm hard enough on myself. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the general social media world has been great for baseball in terms of the information that's out there. I think there's so much more now than, than when we played or 10, 12, 15 years ago. But I think it's uh, the thing I change is just the general outlook that this game is fun. It's meant to be fun. It's not meant to be job like, you know, it's supposed to be a, a, a kid's game that even, you know, some older guys are lucky to play at a, at a pro level. But I just think staying positive and staying level because I've seen, you know, over the past uh, year or so, some really like good minds go at it. And I'm sure you've seen the same thing on Twitter. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, these guys are saying the same thing. They're both incredibly smart. You know, what would happen if they just put down the keyboard for a second, called each other, you know, and, and got on the same page. And it's like that that's pushing the game forward to me. Like the whole push the game forward thing. Isn't like having a, a battle on Twitter. That's not, that's not pushing anything forward except their own egos. You know, for me, it's like, what would be a great thing is use that your platform to connect like we are, for instance, or, or, you know, and, and, use this stuff, you know, to bring that positivity to the game and show kids that, hey, well, do we agree on everything? Definitely, probably not. And, and that's, that's the best part about it. But I just think that uh, social media is kind of a double-edged sword in that sense that, you know, you see a, a lot of great stuff on there, but then you also see some guys where it's like, you know, why not just take, you know, what you're saying and turn it, spin it positive? Because, you know, nobody wants to see their 16-year-old, you know, kid on Twitter 
you know, getting ripped for a, a pitch they threw. It, it's unbelievable. So I think it's, it's uh, in general, to base the baseball world, I would just say more than anything right now, I just think we need a, a positive outlook on things, especially with quarantine and with, you know, baseball stalled out and everyone's uh, a little bit antsy to get after it. I think just being grateful and being positive, as simple as that sounds, because, uh, you know, the, the next generation is really depending on it. And I feel like uh, there's so much pressure um, on these kids to be good quickly just because of, you know, they, they open their phones up and here's a 14 year old throwing 90, you know, and, and they're, they're 18 throwing 83 and they're like, well, what the heck? So I think it's all about staying positive and telling those kids like, look, you don't have to be there right away. You know, you might not fully develop till college or even pro ball, but that's okay. So I think that there's my last point on that. I think there's so many critics, you know, in the world and it's so easy to be a critic, especially when a guy's trying to get better or trying something new. And, and I, would challenge everybody out there to, to the same thing I challenge my players when you don't like something or you don't agree with it try and find the positive in it the way they're seeing it before you respond before you you know go after a guy you know on Twitter yeah, or that's, something. A, that's like, a great point that's a, you know, just, I, that's an awesome point right there absolutely yeah just, yeah, just kind of just think about that because I think that's such a big thing is is everybody has good intentions I don't think anybody in the baseball game has bad intentions I don't want to say that but I just think sometimes if you're a young kid, it comes across as, you know, very pressure filled. And it's like, we should all, we should all be in this together ultimately because all we're trying to do is get guys better. And I think that's the, the more we can stay positive and, and turn something negative into that. I think it, it helps everybody, you know? Absolutely. I think, I think that's a good, a really good point too for parents. I don't know what, what you deal with, but you know, we have some parents come to us and literally what you just said, you know, this kid goes to this high school, he's throwing 92 and he's 14 and my kid's throwing 77, you know, let's get there. And I'm just like, well, you know, let's get the arm, let's get the pain out of his arm first, you know, and like there's steps to get there. And, you know, I feel like it's, it's just as important to educate the parents on the, the process, you know, they want their kids to be that Instagram video now, you know, and it's like one step at a time, you know, so. Yeah. Yep. So, I think this was uh, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Nick. Um, do, you have a, do you have a concluding quote or yeah. anything? You have anything a favorite you quote? you want to leave the, the listeners with? Um, that, that's tough. I mean, as, as cliche as, as it is, man, I, I would just say stay level. You know, my there you go. And, and there in your go. lives and, and uh, you know, in everything you're doing because generally if, if, you, if you stay level, things will, things will fall in your favor and, and, uh, and just stay positive, you know, because it's – it's so tough nowadays, you know, in, in terms of the pressures these kids are seeing. And, and it's a marathon, man. I think, uh, you know, would I ever have pictured that I'd be coaching and doing this for a living? Of course not. <laughs> you know, when I was, I don't think any of us did. It's just kind of something we all uh, fell into. But I, I would just say stay level, guys, and, and, and make sure you have fun with this. Because this game is so much fun. Like doing this type of stuff, you know, really makes my day. So it, it's about, uh, you know, it, how, how can you have fun, stay level, and just stay positive? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. In the name of Overhead Athletics, I'm Max Wardell. This is Carter Kowalczyk. Signing off. Signing off.